Nice. That was mildly entertaining. Yes. All right. So welcome to the first math class. Um, actually, if you could, maybe, I don't know, do people need the lights on? No. no. That's pro yes. It's probably maybe better without because of glare. Yes. Got um, so uh, you're all here because of math stuff. Um, basically, usually a math class would have a very kind of tight focus. Um, we don't. Uh, all of you are at different places and different interest levels for, for math. Some of you want to know it just to know it. Some of you just want to see what's going on. Some of you need it for, um, you know, you want to take some kind of testing thing, GED, kind of worried about that. Some of you might just want to be able to tell others, shut up when they ask you about math. That's probably a big one. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but, so I've decided to kind of start at the beginning uh, with nothing, with counting. Um, everyone in here probably knows how to count. I think most people probably learn when they're like three. Um, and one of my goals today is to kind of really get you to reflect on what a number is and, and relating to counting. Um, but before I get into that, just a general thing about um, kind of how this course will run. It'll run by me talking, because, um, you know, that's what class is, right? Somebody at the front talking. Um, you can ask questions at any time. Uh, there are no dumb questions. That's kind of required to state at the beginning of every class. Um, but really, it, it really is important to think about that in math, because math, the difficulty is not the intricate kind of stuff you might see. It's actually knowing what it is you're doing in the first place. That's the hard part of math, is like, what's the question? What's the starting point? And so when you're confused about that and you feel like asking a question about it, you'll feel kind of dumb about it because you don't understand what's going on. That's a very kind of feeling of dumbness. But that's nothing to be ashamed of. It's very important. Everyone else is probably going to be feeling the same way. So be brave and ask the questions. Um, I will make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes with math. Making mistakes in math is a good thing. Just don't let the mistakes stay. That's a bad thing. So you make mistakes, you correct them. You figure out why they're wrong. You figure out why you made them. And you iterate. You do it again and again. Um, when I look at a math problem, so I'm a math PhD. I've been teaching math for 20 years. I'll look at some word problem. And it's not like a solution instantly appears in my head. That's not how it works. I look at it, and I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about. And so I, I write down some scratchy things and I try to figure out what they're talking about. And by the time I figured out what they're actually asking, then I probably have a good outline about how to proceed and how to do this. Um, so that's the attitude you should have with math and probably anything else. In the beginning, you don't know what it is you're doing. That's the starting point. You don't know. Um, and then you work at it until you do know. So that's the spiel about math. All righty. So numbers. Um, what's the first number? One. All right, so we already have disagreements. <laughs> uh, so uh, one is really kind of, is where it kind of begins in the sense of uh, kind of human history. Um, it was actually kind of an advanced notion about zero of being nothing. Um, because why, how do you account for, for nothing? Why would you account for nothing, right? Like it's not there. Stop talking about it. So, you know, you start with one. And, and what is, so what do we do? We have one, which we write like this, right? Um, and I'll just write over here a little stick. Looks rather similar like a one, right? But this is actually, just be very firm about these things, sticks. Um, two is the next one, of course. And then we have two. Um, three like that. All right, very good. So, um, I'm holding up a uh, number of fingers. How many fingers? Two. Two. Right. I'm holding up two markers, right? Yeah. yeah. But what is two? What actually is two? So I'm using the word two, but what is it? We all, we all clearly know it, right? Like two, two. Two, right? We can all we can count, but what is actually the two? So, initially with counting, what we have is kind of 
a mapping. I know I have the same number of fingers here, right? One here, one here, and I call that two. And so everything, every time I have two items, um, you know, I kind of match it with this kind of sticks in my head, you might say. So that's one notion of two, is we're counting. And that's the fundamental thing, that's the kind of thing that, you know, three-year-olds kind of, they're trying to figure out the sense of the world and they're counting. Um, and that's, that's a good sense of number. Uh, let's see. All right. How many markers am I holding up? Three. Three. I say two. Now, why am I saying two? What were the, what? No, I'd say two red markers then. Um, but it's similar to that notion. Two different colors. No. Here, let me, let me demonstrate. Oh. <laughs> That's why it's only two markers. Right. So, one of the important things about counting and math in general is you've got to be very specific about what you're talking about, right? So, I was saying I only have two markers in my hand because I could only write on this board with two of them, and I knew that. You didn't know that. Um, but, if I somehow want to construct a little tripod out of these markers, then it'd be very reasonable to say three markers for that use case. So, in general, in mathematics, what you need to do is be very clear where you're starting about, what questions you're asking. What you ask to, will inevitably lead to what kind of answer you ought to have. And it's kind of simple right now, but as it goes along, it's more and more and more important to always be asking what it is I'm trying to answer. What am I trying to figure out? And, and that's one of the ways that conventional math classes fail is because everyone in those classes aren't there because they want to be. They're not trying to answer any questions. And if you're not trying to answer any questions, math is pointless. It's like trying to learn how to use a hammer but having nothing to nail something into. It's not going to go well. You know, like, like you have to know why you're doing it. You have to care about it. You have to play around with it. You have to be confused and then figure it out. All right. Good. Let's continue on. Uh, four, five, six, seven. You notice how I'm slowing down here? <laughs> Nine. Oh, good. I've lost. The seven one still has six. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ah, that's one off. Uh, another tip to learn is uh, mathematicians are always off by one. So, yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. I didn't intend that, but it was proving my point. When you look at these, instantly you can see how many there are, right? Two, three, four. As you go along, it becomes harder and harder. And in fact, what would we usually do if we were tallying stuff, right? It's all the same here, and then we do that, right? It helps us, and then, you, and then it's really hard to make mistakes after that. And you can do that for a series of times. So this is, you know, we're grouping these things together, right? Because our brains can only handle somewhere between 5 and 10, probably around 6 or 7 is what, you know, you basically can look at and know the count of. Um, one exercise to try and improve it, if you care, is to just grab a handful of stuff and plop it down and guess the number and then count and then do that again with something else. And eventually, if you do it enough, maybe you can get up to like eight or nine, just looking at it if you really care. Um, it's training the brain. It's not logic. It's not thinking. It's it's training your brain to do things that you're not paying attention to. That's um, also important in mathematics. All right, uh, I stopped here at nine, but there's a number after nine, right? Mm -hmm. 
And what's the symbol for, for the number after nine? One and zero. One, what? Two? Two symbols? Come on, man. One. What's the what's the single symbol? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is ten. It's one zero. Um, so, oh, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, 10, what happens here? What happens here is we don't like having lots of different symbols to remember, right? Mm -hmm. um, some cultures do, ours doesn't. Um, and particularly with numbers, we have the digits. Well, I guess there is, at this point, what is this zero, right? I haven't even said what zero is. So let me backtrack a little. Put a zero here. Okay, done. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing there. Um, so here, this zero is what we call a placeholder. It's holding a place of, of ones. Um, sort of, we call that the ones, and we call that the tens. Um, so we have one group of ten and no group of ones. And then eleven is. 10 plus an extra little thing. I'm switching notation from these little chicken scratches because they're really annoying me um, to just thinking of the next number as the previous number with an additional stick, additional one. All right. And then 12, you know, which is also an equals means it's the same thing on either side. Um, let's say 10 plus 2. And so immediately as we're trying to develop this number system, we're getting into the notion of addition, right? We're adding, we're adding things to this base. Um, and it's almost definitional. Uh, we, are, we can think of it as each next number is the previous number plus one. That's kind of how we think of defining it. Alrighty, and we keep going. We get down to 19 and then what happens? We add one more, and now we have two groups of 10. And, you know, uh, no ones. And so it's like we're just going along a counter, and then uh, after nine, this one goes to zero, and the next one goes to two. Good. All right. What's the next kind of um, next place over after the tens place? Hundreds. Hundreds. All right. So we go like 10, 20, 30, all the way down, 90, and then 100. And this is 10 groups of 10 or 100 groups of 1. So... Um, and if I were to try to do the, the chicken scratch in here, how many would I have to do? 20. 20. So there's five each. So in one group of 10, uh, there's two. And then there's 10 groups of, uh, of 10. So that's two plus two plus two and it becomes 20. Um, and so that's already trying to do the stick stuff is like beyond my capabilities as a human being to write that down. Um, so this is, you know, as we progress, this fundamental limitation of how many things we can write down is what's behind increasing notations. All right. And, you know, with a hundred, you can do 101, 102, and then you do, you know, 109 and it becomes 110 and so on. And then you get 200 and you go on. And then what's next? Thousands. Thousands. We're still doing good. Thousands, thousands, fine. So I could write something like 1,234. Um, it's a sequence. So this is 1,000. That's 200. 
and that's 30, and that's 4. And so we can also view it, and this is kind of important, as taking 1,000 sticks and 200 sticks and 30 sticks and 4 sticks and putting them all in one big pile. So that's what this number means, 1,234. It's a beautiful number. So um, imagine trying to count that out. Take a long time, right? Um, uh, All righty. But if you had, um, let's say, dollar bills, right? You had four ones, three tens, uh, two one hundred dollar bills, and one one thousand dollar bill. I'm sure that must exist somewhere. Um, and you can see how, you know, the money is dealing with units in a way that we can handle. If you just had a thousand two hundred thirty four ones, it would be a very painful economy to live in. So we're compressing things. All right. And after a thousand, what happens? Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Then a hundred thousand and then a million. a million all right let's look at a million so um, okay one million okay uh, anybody know the convention of how we write numbers of this size Ron? Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, something simpler first, though. Adding commas. Yes. Um, so, at least America, we use commas. Europe, they use commas for something else, so I don't actually know what they use for separation. Peri they use periods there? Oof. Oof. Yeah, it's very confusing. Um, be aware if you start reading European numbers. Um, All righty. Uh, so, we do this. We use groups of three for the numbers because, again, our brains can handle that, whereas having, uh, what, seven digits here? That's getting to the, the end of what we can handle as, as just looking at things. So if I just write um, I don't know, uh, this, right, and you just look at it, it's pretty hard to read. But now, if I add in these commas, I start from the right-hand side, which is kind of annoying, um, and go over three and go over another three. So this is the millions place. So we've got 23 million. And then we got 557,000. So this is the thousands. And then 892. And so, you know, this kind of comma notation is extremely useful. Um, what's after millions? Ten million. Ten million. Ten million. Hundred million. It is a thousand million, but it's also called a billion. Yes. Um, so then you got billions, and so how many digits are in a billion? Or I, I should say, how many zeros? It's easier to nine. So, kind of nine zeros. And after billions, 10 billion, 100 billion, and then? Trillion. Trillions. Trillions. All right. And then that's going to be 12 zeros after the one. Anybody know what 15 zeros would it be? Quadrillion. 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 And quintillion. But we really stopped talking about it at that point. Um, well, I like to think in terms of, uh, uh, well, actually, yeah, I have no use for those things. Um, but usually, I mean, there are numbers that get that large. Uh, like if you compute the number of stars in the universe, you'll get a rather large number. Um, but again, in terms of what humans can handle, at this, at this point, it's sort of like, it stops. And so we use something else for that notation. Um, we'll talk about it more in some other class, but just to, this is an incredibly important um, notation. It's really ugly. So I'm just going to put it out there to sort of like 
plant a seed. Um, but let's go back to 1,234. Uh, when you look at that number, what's the important stuff about this number? Is it the four? So if, if I'm going to, if I owe you $1,234 and I change a number here, uh, you know, to like, instead I pay you 1,233, do you really care? Probably not too much. But if I were to change this one to a, say a zero, do you care? Yeah. 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 Um, so the, the leading digit is what's very important. Um, and this is another thing that math education usually gets wrong. All of the algorithms for computing stuff, except in division, because that was too hard to screw up, I guess. Um, they, they tend to focus on the ones. You get the ones right, and you end up getting this, this thousand wrong with their, their algorithms. So that's, you know, bad. I'll, I'll, uh, when I get to arithmetic in detail, I'll show you the right ways of doing these things. Um, but the most important thing is to understand you care about thousands more than ones, you know? Like that's a fundamental kind of starting point. Don't mess that up. You can mess this up. Um, and so there's a notation we, 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 we often write um, where we use this decimal point. Um, and you particularly see it on calculators, but I personally like it. This E is kind of saying, um, uh, it, it tells you, you know, like this, this tells me thousands, kind of three zeros. Um, and if I had something like, so if, so if I saw this, 1.234 E6, that's like kind of like six zeros in my mind. Um, and so that tells me it's a million. Um, and there's rules of manipulating the numbers of this form, which make multiplication really kind of easy to get this leading number correct. Um, we'll talk about it later. But the most important thing is just to really start thinking about what do you care about a number? What's the most important part of a number? And how do you communicate that? And so that's what that is. All righty. So that's numerical notation. Not bad. We went very fast. Um, <laughs> questions? Good time to, to pause. I think I've actually seen that particular form of notation with the E ever in my life, and I don't know why that is, but um, what would you refer to that notation type as? Um, either scientific notation, if you take it to the extreme um, of always just having uh, one digit here, um, then that's scientific. But there's also engineering notation, which um, is actually a little uh, more friendly to human speaking. So, because, you know, engineers are practical people. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, if I had 12,587 as my number, scientific would say 1.2587, and there's 1, 2, 3, 4, so E4. But engineers, but, you know, then you have to remember, like, 4 is 10,000, right? That's a little cumbersome. So engineers go, like, Shh. all right, uh, I have a 12, and then whatever, and then E3. And so this says 12,000. So you just have to remember that three is a thousand, six is a million, nine is a billion, 12 is a trillion, and, and you can just instantly read off 12,000. Right. So that's kind of the engineering notation. And again, so similar to uh, talking to people, I prefer engineers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there are advantages to the scientific thing if you're never actually talking to people and you're just doing computations. It's a little bit easier for some of the computations. Uh, Phil? So it seems like all, in all of these examples of scientific notation, you've only shown examples where using scientific notation makes the process of writing the number actually longer, which is kind of defeats the purpose 
those changes were based on, right? Um, not necessarily. Um, but yes, I mean, so you can have zeros, uh, and then this makes it a little easier. So 12,580, uh, for example, uh, I have to write this all out like this, but in scientific notation, say I can just write 1.258 and still 1, 2, 3, 4, and just write that. And so it does shorten it. Um, and of course, when we get into it uh, much later, um, if we get into it, uh, there's a lot of like rounding and you just don't care about these things and you just drop them out. And that's really the advantage of these kinds of things is just dropping stuff you don't care about. Um, but really, I, I, I take the most important thing about this notation is simply being able to say, you know, I don't have to count places. This four is telling me what I need to know in terms of the size of the number. Um, it's like I look at the leading digit, which are always ones. Uh, 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 like this number, you know, it doesn't need to be ones. Three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and so this is telling me uh, it's 30 million is how I read that notation. To me, that's the value of it. Um, and, you know, and then I can also just say, I don't care about that crap, and just write 3.25E7. Uh, it was Rowan? Um, I was wondering how you got introduced to the concept of, like, doing math from the left side and approach to the right side on, like, almost all conventional schools. Like, start with the one, like, when you're doing addition, like, the MCU way. Um, I'll talk about it more in a, when I get into addition, but basically, um, what I'm a big fan of is like getting a rough sense of a number. So if I'm, if I'm, you know, if I care about something like, you know, I don't know, uh, a number like 5,381 and, uh, I want to add like 2,730 to it. I don't care about the ones. I just don't. And so I just look, I just look at the, the left-hand side. Um, precision, theoretically, doesn't care how you figure it out. But if you only care about it roughly, then you only focus on the largest ones. And so that's why. Um, and there are ways of writing things out, uh, which I'll show that you can do the precise computation starting with the largest stuff. Um, but what do what people do before zero? Uh, uh, I think it was just, I don't know, I guess they just didn't need it. Um, I mean, they had placeholders, I believe, but they didn't really think of zero as a number. Um, it was, it was, you know, they used numbers for accounting, for counting, right? And like, no one says, oh, I've got zero sheep out in the field, right? You, you don't need to say that. You can say I have no sheep, I suppose, but you don't really, um, you know, that, that didn't really seem to be as needed until like the introduction of algebra and things canceling and all that kind of stuff. At least that's what I understand. Caroline? So when you have 1.234 and 6 means a million, what if you just, if you just wanted to write 1 million, would you write 1 decimal E6? Um, oh, it have the, it was just a yeah. Well, you don't need the decimal. You can just write one e six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Alrighty. Uh, so I've introduced some numbers. Is there a, a largest number? All right. Why isn't there a largest number? How do I know that? Declan. Hmm? Declan? Because we're constantly leaving more information. Maybe 
one day we find it, make it the largest number, but some other time we need to make something more than that. Okay, so let's say we had a largest number. I really like to start with ones. Um, 9878565. Let's say I'm absurd and I say that's the largest number. How do you convince me I'm wrong? Rowan? You could have 9878566. Right. So just add one, right? 9878566. So um, this is, we just did a proof that there's no largest number. Mm -hmm. um, basically, how that proof go? It was, we assumed there was a largest number. I mean, I, I wrote down a specific number just to make it clear. But you could write, you could just say, I've got this largest number. And then it's like, how do you prove that wrong? You add one, you get another number. All right. So that's what the math community loves. It's true in a sense. Um, and essentially, you know, basically it's our, our first sense of infinitely many numbers. So if I were to spend my entire life just writing down numbers, my whole life, and um, the next generation did the same thing, and the next generation, the next generation, they'd never run out of numbers, right? You just keep on going. Okay. And so, and that's some sense of infinitely many. You just, you never run out. It's always there. Um, but is it really true? Are there really infinitely many numbers? I've kind of just argued for it, but is it really true? I mean, is it, is it practical for, um, to look at the entire span of human history and look at all those numbers? Um, would that show us if we had infinitely many numbers? There's a limitation on our ability to count. Right. Um, and that limitation is kind of based on the fact there's only so many humans, so many seconds in a day. Time. People. Yeah. Um, on a computer, for example, there is a largest number in the default kind of computer language that's on there. It's built in. Um, hmm? Yeah, there's different like limits for the, the integers in a language. Although you can work around it because you can have blocks of numbers and so you can build it up. Um, but there's still a limitation even with these machines. And so there's, again, we get to the question of, you know, what do we re really mean? What do we want out of it, right? What do we mean by kind of infinitely mean many numbers? Do we really care about that? Or do we just care like it's so large? Like if, if, if somehow you could imagine that, you know, you couldn't add one to some number, but the number's so vastly large that we'd never see it, would that make any difference? Right? Um, and so, you know, that's sort of kind of like the rabbit holes that mathematicians go down, is that kind of like, you can argue about this stuff, you can think about it, but it's like, in the end of the day, what does it matter? And so, one of the things that happens in mathematics is, we don't really need to care that there's infinitely many numbers, but there's certain things that are very useful if we just kind of assume it, we work it out, and we use those conclusions. Um, and so it's really this kind of notion of what are you trying to do, how do you model it, what's, what's kind of useful about it. Uh, All righty, enough with infinity. Oh, um, by the way, there's different sizes of infinities, too, in mathematics. It's kind of weird. And you can even add one to infinity, um, which is also weird. But again, it's a choice as to whether it really is there or is not there. Now, uh, all righty. Um, oh, yes. 
let's go into a bit more about um, some addition. So, now that we know what these things are, three plus four. Um, so this is seven, but um, how how can we get at what that is? What is it? Kind of. If I don't know that, how do I get convinced about it? So. Sticks. Sticks. Always do sticks. Yes. So you can write this three as one two three, and you can write this four as one two three four, and then you count right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you get seven sticks. And so fundamentally that's at the root of addition is um, counting. That addition is simplified counting. Because three plus four, that was already kind of annoying enough, right? Three sticks, four sticks. Um, and then imagine trying to do that with like, uh, well, eight plus five, for example. Not too much bigger, but now how many sticks do I need to write down here? Eight and five here. And so we've got two groups of 10 and then one group of three. And so you get 13. Uh, and so, you know, we don't really want to keep doing that. So, one way, if you don't know your, your sums of dealing with arithmetic on this level, is to make a big old table. It's not the only table to be made, but it's a good one to start. And uh, I guess it probably starts with zero. Um, you start with zero, one, two, three, zero plus anything. You're adding no sticks, you get the same thing back, right? Um, and then uh, one plus one is two. 1 plus 2 is 3, and what's happening as we go along is we're just adding 1, right? And so it's very uh, easy to just kind of fill it out. And then the next one going down, you know, you're adding 1. And so you can fill out this whole kind of, oh, I guess I should, sorry, 10. Um, you can fill out this whole table. And, if, and then you can look at it like 6 plus 5 it comes 11. And if you don't know all these sums, this is an exercise you can do to, um, to learn them. Make this table, uh, write down numbers, look on the table, and figure it out. Uh, it's sort of a a basic skill. Most people seem to to be able to do addition like this. Multiplication is a little bit different. We'll get to that. Um, but you know, it's like the basic data in your brain. That's what you have to start start off with. Um, so, if you don't know what eight plus seven is, you know, use this kind of table construction to to figure it out. Um, it's just got to be something kind of ingrained. You don't want to have to keep thinking through those things. It really slows down the later math to build on. And it's just something that you work through until you know it. Um, it's, not, it's not really conceptual. It's not like smart or dumb about it. It's just kind of like taking it in and being familiar with it. Um, well, okay. Sure. 
Sure. I mean, a little harder with multiplication uh, to think about it, but certainly with addition, for example, you can have things like this. So if you want to do, if you want to learn five plus eight, you take out these chips. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You make an actual pile of it. Yeah, and then you, and then and then you you just count. Yeah. So, um, making things very physical like this, it also helps the brain really in, implant it. It makes it kind of kind of real. It's like you look at it and you're like, oh, okay, maybe the blue chip is ten, and so you take away. Um, all right. You might actually want to use fives, but <laughs> whatever. Um, assume you get that point. It's also uh, the abacus is another thing that one can deal do with. It has it's kind of like these chips, um, but kind of on a wire, um, and so you can count kind of that way. And, and multiplication is uh, somewhat easier with those things. But all right, so that's kind of the most simplest form of addition. Um, Now, uh, what about the other thing? What's the opposite of addition? Subtraction. 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 So, what is subtraction? I've got like, I have seven things, and I want to remove three of them. How many do I have left? Four. 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 So, I have four left. And we would write this mathematically as 7 minus 3 you know, equals 4. And all it means is I've got a pile of these 7 chips. And what did I say? Remove 3. I remove 3, and I've got 4 left. So that's, that's kind of what subtraction is. Again, it's back to counting, right? I've got a collection of, of sticks, and then I want to remove three, which makes this little slash kind of painful. Um, and then I have four left over. So, uh, hmm? I jokingly said that's eight. Oh, okay. Yes. All righty. Now, good. simple addition and subtraction. Okay. In my hands, I have four white chips, two blue chips, put them together, uh, and I lose one. Thank you. Um, now, how many do I have? So, uh, I have six chips, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I do have two blue chips and four white chips. If these represented ones and these represented tens, I would then have 24. So, again, even in the simple case of counting, um, what question you're trying to answer is very important. If, if if you want to know how much money is in a pouch of cash, for example, you know, what's the natural kind of step? It's to count out the different kinds of bills and then put the total value together, right? Um, so that's the whole process. Um, the, most, the most difficult process, part of that, would be the counting. You know, if you've got like, I don't know, a random number, um, 50 20s in front of you, counting them all out accurately is going to be hard, right? You can get lost in the details. Um, and at the end of the day, if you just say you have 50 20s, that's not actually answering the question of how much money you have, right? So again, with, with math, it's always about knowing what the, the final kind of question you're trying to answer um, is about.
Uh, lots of times, I've been teaching for 20 years, students will do the, the hard you know, computations and then not actually have the answer. Um, they'll have it, they'll have well, the difficult part done, but they won't actually answer the question. Um, and it's because they got lost in the details. Um, so, you know, if I say, how many chips, I mean, how many do I have in my hand? You say, well, what do you mean? How many chips do you have? How many white chips, blue chips, some value associated with it? It's, it's important to ask the question at the very beginning, what it is you want from whatever it is you're doing. Without that, um, math can go horribly wrong, and I've seen that many times. Um, well, sometimes a, a probe will qua crash into Mars. <laughs> it's happened. Um, mainly because they were not, they didn't know whether they were dealing with blue chips or white chips, essentially. So, these things happen. Alrighty. Uh, let's see. What's, what's the next thing? Um, a little bit of multiplication. So, So, 3 times 4, or 3 dot 4. That apparently tripped somebody up once upon a time of not knowing what the dot meant. Uh, could also be 3x4. This all means 3 you know, times 4, multiplying it. And what does it mean? Well, it represents the idea that I have a group of 3 4 times. three, um, four times. I'm repeating that. And so, how many is that? Twelve. Twelve. And so, uh, in terms of chips, it would be the same thing. Three chips, three chips, three chips, three chips, and you just count them up. So, um, that would be it gets a little out of hand uh, with the larger numbers of multiplications, but um, you know uh, you can again make a table if that suits you. Not if you don't want to. Um, but there are patterns here. So if I have if I say three times one, what do I mean? One group of three, right? Or three groups of one. Either way, I have a total of three, right? And so one times anything um, is just itself. And then two, well, what does two mean? Two means double. double. Um, I have the same number plus the other same number. And so you have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And then 3, you do that. You do 3, add another 3 for 3 times 2, 6. Add another 3 to get 9. Add another 3, 12, 15, and so on. Um, it's pretty important to know how to multiply the numbers from 1 to 9. Again, it's just a basic kind of fact that you have to kind of be comfortable with in order for everything else to work out well. Um, so if you don't know what 7 times 8 is, for example, uh, I'd encourage you to, if you want to proceed with this class, to kind of like work it out and figure it out and, and start memorizing it. Um, it is a memorization thing. It can be, you know, using this table, it could be using chips, sticks, just figuring out because maybe you know that 7 times 5 is 35 and you want 7 times 8 so you add 7 to 35 three times and you figure figure that out. Um, it's, it's, it's not exciting. It's not intellectually challenging. It's just trying to input that stuff in your brain. Um, those are kind of the fundamental facts. The addition table and the multiplication table 
are the kind of two things that you need to have in order for the stuff I'd talk about next time to make sense, to be able to work with it. Um, as we deal with adding and multiplying larger numbers um, and techniques for dealing with that, this is the kind of thing that you would just need to, to know. Um, so, uh, there's that. All right. And then there's one more operation. Basic nature? Division. Division. Uh, I guess I didn't actually write down multiplication anywhere. This was multiplication. All right. And now division. So just like kind of subtracting is undoing addition, division is kind of un undoing multiplication. So what would that mean? If I wanted to kind of undo multiplication, what's my starting point? So I had before 3 times 4 equals 12. What would I start with division if I wanted to undo something? You start with 12. Yeah, I'd start with a 12. And I would say um, 12 divided by 4, for example. And what would that mean? It's cutting 12 up into four groups. Mm -hmm. So make four groups out of 12. So how can I do that? Well, I have four sticks, four sticks, four sticks. All right, and that's probably it. Um, and so, how many groups do I have? Three. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm very bad at that bracket. Um, three groups. And so, 12, we might write a slash. 12 divided by 4 equals 3. It's also 12, this weird little symbol. I only ever saw in like K-12 math, I don't know, it rarely ever appears outside of that. Um, it's always kind of this thing. Um, so that's what division is. Now, um, it's the reverse of multiplication. Multiplication. And so, in order to kind of be good at division, you got got to kind of have to be good about multiplication. Should you? No. Oh, I'll wrap it up. Um, so, um, you know, being good with the multiplication facts kind of means like you can possibly reverse it. So, if like as, as I said before, seven times eight is fifty-six. So, if I knew that and I wanted to divide fifty-six into eight groups, I would know it's seven because 7 times 8 is 56. Um, all right. So uh, let's say I have, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 chips. And I want to divide it into two groups. Well, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, Three, okay, and then I have one left over, right? The remainder. So division is not nice like multiplication is. Um, multiplication, I can take kind of any two numbers, multiply them together, and I get a nice simple number, just like that. Um, but division isn't. And so there are different ways of dealing with it. Right now, I would just do the um, just something like, uh, well, let's say 13 divided into four groups and 
I know in my head that 12 is divided by 4 and gives you um, groups of 3. And so I can just do that, and then I have 1 left over. And again, it would depend on what all you're trying to do. If I was dividing, um, I don't know, $13 to four people, right? What would I want to do? I'd probably give everybody $3 and then a quarter to each of the people. Um, yeah, or you could keep the dollar and get a chocolate bar. Um, or you could give it to one of these people. Like, that's beyond the scope of math, what you want to do with that remainder. <laughs> Just try not to get into a conflict over it. Um, so, you know, like, division creates um, problems. Addition didn't create problems. Multiplication didn't create problems. What about subtraction? I was... Josh? Possibility of negative numbers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, totally wrong way. Um, three minus five. So I've got three sticks, and I want to remove five sticks. Is this a problem? Yeah. So what are my options? Well, you could just say I take all three sticks and I'm at zero, right? That's the rule. Not necessarily. Some, some depends on what you're really trying to do, right? Like even if using like I need five sticks, I've got three, you need two more, you go and find some more sticks, right? The bank doesn't do that. Doesn't do what? Just let you have zero if you overdraft. Yes. Take note of that. Um, so, subtraction created a situation, like division, you've got this kind of like leftover kind of thing. In subtraction, you have a leftover kind of thing. Um, and these are called negative numbers. And I will no doubt talk about them more next time. Um, but, you know, it's... It's important to kind of observe what we're doing here. Uh, we've got some like just basic counting stuff, and we say, okay, we can remove stuff. We've got that, but maybe I'm trying to remove too much. And now I've gotten this question. And the answer to what you want to do really depends on the context of what you're actually trying to do. There isn't like a right or wrong answer. It depends on what the question is. Um, I mean, I suppose if someone said minus one, that'd probably be wrong, because <laughs> what would that be? Anyway, uh, I guess that's good enough. I've got a, yeah, we've got a meeting to go to. All right, any questions? All righty.